I graduated from John F. Kennedy High School in the Bronx with a D average, but I earned a PhD from Princeton University. <laughs> This is a story about once being afraid to learn, to now having an ongoing love affair with reading and learning that has not stopped. This is a story about Dr. Keith Mays, but this is also a story about the power of black studies, the importance of the black intellectual tradition, and the relevance of the black experience. I want to demonstrate why we need to bring the black experience into the K-12 classroom where every black student sits. Many struggles surfaced during my high school career, but I would like to underscore one that involved my dad when I was in the ninth grade. He made me read Muhammad Ali's autobiography entitled The Greatest. The first problem with the book was it was rendered as a form of punishment. The second problem was it was just too big. And mind you now, this was over the summer. <laughs> but the real issue was, I was afraid to read it. I was afraid to read it because I had not developed the wherewithal to learn. The book had no immediate import for me because in my formative years of education, no one had bothered to connect the larger black world I had come from to the possibilities of learning. Too often, for young black students, reading feels like a reprimand, a form of punishment. How can you extract all of the personal joy and all of the liberatory possibilities from one of the most simplest activities? That's reading. No one had explained the relationship between reading and my black identity development. It wasn't until I read the autobiography of Malcolm X many years later that my desire to understand my surroundings triggered. I was fascinated by Harlem and all of its decay. I wanted to understand why so many young black men sold drugs on the streets, why were there so many liquor stores in, in the neighborhood, and why were there burnt out tenements on every block. When traversing the streets back and forth from my apartment to the campus of the City College of the City University of New York, I became enthralled over the pre-gentrification aesthetics of this urban black community, my community. I found the answers as to why my neighborhood looked this way in black books. I found the answers to the state of black America in black books. I found the answers to the predicament of Africa in black books. But it wasn't only Malcolm X's autobiography. Also, Chancellor Williams' The Destruction of Black Civilization, Ralph Ellison's The Invisible Man, Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, Claude Brown's Man Child in the Promised Land, Nell Painter, The Exodusters, Toni Morrison's Beloved, and Cornel West's Race Matters. The destruction of black civilization demonstrated that the continent of Africa had a rich history and culture that stood on its own before repeated European and Arab invasions. Manchild in the Promised Land depicted a, a Harlem of the 1940s and 1950s that was very reminiscent of the Harlem I grew up in in the 1970s and 1980s. Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings explained the life struggles of my own black teenage mother who birthed me at 16, the same age Maya gave birth to her daughter. And Race Matters contextualized my anger and rage as a young black man by talking about how nihilism permeated black America. Before black books helped me earn a PhD from Princeton University, Reading black books saved my life. They kept me off the streets. They kept me academically focused. They provided a sense of direction. They made me believe one day I could be a university professor. More importantly, black books gave me the desire to finally want to learn. I learned how to learn through the discovery of reading, but I discovered reading 
because of my own black experience. I believe we can use the black experience as a vehicle to transform urban education and black student performance in the classrooms. Many of us know about the number of problems black students face, which have life and death implications, and now represents a major public health issue. In school districts across the country, the graduation rates of black students hovers between 40 and 65 percent. In some individual schools, the completion rate for black students is below 50 percent. Reading and math proficiency is in the 50th percentile, and in some schools, even much less than that. All of this contributes to the school-to-prison pipeline, pushing frustrated black students into the streets. After languishing in these educational graveyards, too many now languish in prisons across the United States. Why do we fail to see the life and death implications of not educating every black and brown student? We do not have a problem understanding the relationship between a doctor and his or her patient. The doctor knows what's at stake. The cut and laceration has to be disinfected and bandaged. The bone has to be reset. The artery has to be bypassed. The tumor has to be removed. The doctor doesn't judge the incoming condition. He or she just administers the care. If, the, if it's the doctor's responsibility to reset the body, then it's the educator's responsibility to reset the mind by reestablishing the desire to learn. In the medical context, we get it. But we have failed to translate that same sense of urgency and importance to the classroom, from teacher to student, especially from white teacher to black and brown student. And it's not, this is not an indictment on white teachers, because there are many good white teachers and bad black and brown ones. But our classroom caretakers must pay attention to those scars, those lacerations, those wounds, those broken minds and spirits that are trapped inside of failing schools. It is not the student's fault. It's the systems, an educational system that likes to focus on numerical gaps, like graduation rates and test scores, but fails to see the more important gaps that black students and students of color bring. The inspiration gap, the motivation gap, the engagement gap, the belief gap, and the relationship gap. Notwithstanding the deficits that black students bring to the school, it is still the job of those who work inside the system to inspire and motivate, to understand their racial reality, to engage black students with, the intellect with intellectual content and instructional styles that will foster stronger and trusting relationships between student and teacher and to forever close the belief gap that says with so much ferocity that the American dream is not for young people of color. As a young black student in New York City, these gaps were more circumscriptive and definitive in my everyday life than the numerical ones. So why would we as a society eschew the very things that can inspire, motivate, engage black students in the classroom? Why would we want to preclude the possibilities of creating better relationships with black students and inculcating within them the belief that they too can achieve anything in this world? Currently, our classrooms are not built to bring in the black experience, not at the level of the curriculum, not at the level of pedagogical practice, and not at the level of administrative will. The reason that's the case is because there is nothing in the toolbox. What's in the toolbox of classroom teachers and administrators that can be transformative in the lives of young boys and girls? Some good things currently exist, but if we were to open up the toolbox, too often we would find the saw of indifference, the wrench of low expectation, the clamp of mediocrity, the nail of white racism, the hammer of oppression, and the tape measure of failure. What we would not find is the creative use of the black experience that not only teaches, but is also transforming the lives of young black people. 
So let me take you back to my early days in New York City and explain the major ingredients that went into transforming my life. I call it the early days of being an autodidact. It's when the different worlds of arts and letters, social justice, and the city university surrounded and collapsed around me. It's when a very public grassroots struggle educated me about the excessive use of police force. The victims of excessive force were not Philando Castile or Alton Sterling, but rather Abner Louima and Amadou Diallo. The leaders of these organizations of the grassroots movements were not Black Lives Matter, Neighborhood Organizers for Change, Nikima Levy Pounds, or Wintana Melikine, but rather Al Sharpton, C. Vernon Mason, and Alton Maddox. We must never castigate black, black movements for change, but recognize how they are part of the rich tapestry of intergenerational protests and that they too have the power to educate. Street corner black book vendors whose tables line 125th Street in Harlem continue to feed the black experience to me, helping provide the historical context to the modern day black struggle occurring in the streets. I took courses with black professors at City College, such as Leonard Jeffries, James Small, and Venus Green, as well as white professors who also had a great impact on me, like Lou Major, Darren Steloff, and David Jaffrey. Then came the undergraduate research programs designed specifically to encourage and nurture a pathway into the academy for undergraduate students of color. Not only did I spend my entire $5,000 summer stipend buying black books, it was here where the groundwork was laid to apply to major programs, graduate programs in history. What I am describing to you is a seven-year process that it took for me just to put myself in the position to apply to doctoral programs, much less earn a PhD. Academically disengaged black students don't have seven years after they turn 18 to recover a lost sense of self. It's usually too late. Intellectual and personal transformation is not on the mind of people who have long decided that education is not for them. They have succumbed and now exist at the margins of our society. So what does the power mean, what does the power of the black experience mean to a five-year-old black girl or a 10-year-old black boy or a 15-year-old black student? What does the black experience mean to a white teacher who lives in the suburbs but teaches at a predominantly, uh, teaches a large number of, of, of students of color? Is there anything in the lives of the students that could be a source of knowledge for you as a teacher? What about the background of the students that could be a source of knowledge for them in their edification and their personal, personal transformation? It is not a given that I know much about the black experience just because I am black. Chances are I know very little. But what I do know is that the key to my liberation exist in the very fibers of my being, in the, within the innermost corners of my soul. W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book called The Souls of Black Folk, but he also followed that up with a book called The Gift of Black Folk, explaining how black people's greatest gift to American society were the black experiences that contributed to the economic, social, and cultural development of the United States. As a young black student, this is what I need to know. And I need to hear it from you as the teacher, as well as to read it for myself. But how is the teacher to teach something that he, or he does not know? How is the teacher going to teach something that she does not care about? How is the teacher going to teach something that his or her principal does not support? How does the principal give support to teachers who want to teach about the black experience when white parents are hostile to it? I've just underscored much of the problem today. Lack of knowledge about the black experience, lack of will to teach the black experience, lack of administrative support and vision by the district and or site leader, and white parent backlash and overall fear of the black experience inside school buildings and classrooms. The longer we wait to transform our curriculum, especially social studies and English, 
the stronger the message is sent. The message being sent is, we may not mind having black bodies in the classroom, we just don't want your experience being taught inside the classroom. But resistors must understand that this train has long left the station. You cannot separate the experiences of people of color from the intellectual movements that represent them. The ethnic studies movement is here to stay. It is not going anywhere. It's a movement that has multiple points of entry, dating back to the 19th century. But its later embodiments have been at Howard University in 1967, San Francisco State in 1968, and the explosion of black and ethnic studies programs and departments across the country in 1969 and beyond. We see today in places like Tucson, Arizona, that there are people trying to put the ethnic studies genie back in the bottle. The resistors are realizing that those courageous Latino brothers and sisters are part of a larger movement that exists beyond one city like Tucson. The resistors may not fully be aware that how broad, long, and deep this intellectual insurgency is, but it only feels like an intellectual insurgency because of your intent to resist it. The people who oppose black studies or ethnic studies yesterday and today were and are on the wrong side of history. Just like the people opposing queer and trans movements today will see that they were on the wrong side of history tomorrow. I always tell my students, don't find yourselves on the wrong side of history. So I wanna say to state education commissioners, district leaders, principals and classroom teachers, don't find yourselves on the wrong side of history. Don't allow the good work that you're already doing, like in Minneapolis public schools, with the creation of ethnic studies courses in the Office of Black Male Student Achievement under the leadership of Michael Walker to wither away from a lack of administrative support and teacher resistance. The most important barometer in education is what students say about their learning experience. Listen to any student of color that has sat inside a class related to his or her experience or has read a book about their experience and typically they will say that it was the most exhilarating and transformative experience in their college or in their high school career. I hear this from students all the time in the Department of African American and African Studies here at the University of Minnesota where I teach. I also hear this from students in Minneapolis Public Schools in Miss Courtney Bell's high school African American history class and from students in the Building Lives Acquiring Cultural Knowledge class taught by Jamil Jackson and Corey Yeager. Think about the academically marginal student looking for inspiration, hope, and personal validation. There isn't any other place a student can go to begin resetting the mind, but that student cannot do it alone. Once the student is on his or her way, yes, there is some level of autodidacticism, but the marginal black student needs a curriculum that speaks to his or her experience, black books that speaks to his or her history and culture, and an instructional style from the teacher that can inspire, inspire intellectual curiosity and transform behavior. Education is a service mission which means the student is on the receiving end of your ability to help him or her discover. So once and for all, let's discover the power of the black experience and its ability, ability to rehabilitate us all and to bring us together rather than the fear of the black experience that many assume will keep us divided and apart. Thank you.